time. Welcome back to the Juniors for Abstracts and Prizes, which I've been looking forward to so much. And uh, so we're, we're almost exactly back on time, except for five minutes, so we're doing fine. And um, now, I'm hoping that we have them either live or... Oh, thumbs up from the back. Hurrah, terrific. Now, so the first one, they are in order, and um, uh, not in order of which is better than which, but these are the four that were, that were uh, but by uh, an expert panel decided were the most representative nationally as some of the best research being done in Scotland right now. And so it's a privilege to chair the session and not about, I've been bursting to do this for two years to have the kids back for abstracts, it's great. So first, without any more chat for me, Fiona Johnston from Glasgow, you've got Hello. about seven minutes to tell us about your brilliant research, please go, go ahead. Oh. Okay, hi everyone. I hope you're well. I'm Fiona. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Glasgow and I'm going to present you my project last year for my intercalated degree, which is in proving the detection and management of atrial fibrillation after ischemic stroke. Well, what is atrial fibrillation? It is an atrial arrhythmia that is defined as an irregularly irregular rhythm with a lack of P waves on an ECG for greater than 30 seconds. And in fact, the most important heart-related cause of stroke is atrial fibrillation. And those who suffer an AF-related stroke experience greater morbidity and mortality. And it's actually the stroke type with the highest risk of recurrence, this being between 12 and 20% in the first month after the stroke. However, a 12 lead ECG that someone would receive in an emergency department only has a 3% AF detection rate. So if AF is the cause of the stroke, then it's highly unlikely that that would be picked up. At the Queen Elizabeth right now, this is our current pathway uh, for prolonged cardiac monitoring. So if it is suspected that someone has atrial fibrillation, this is carried out by the cardiology department, not the stroke service. Um, patients receive a variable duration of monitoring, somewhere between three and seven days. If they're an inpatient, they receive their monitoring in hospital. If they're an outpatient, they're invited back for an appointment. Um, cardiology then collate the results together. They inform us of the results and then we let the patient know their results. So there's quite a delay between the stroke actually happening and AF being detected and the patient being told of this. And we found this delay was even greater during the pandemic. So we proposed that all patients would be referred for a seven day ECG and monitors would be fitted within 48 hours of the stroke in house. If the patient was an inpatient, the monitor would just be removed after seven days. And if they'd been discharged, then the ESD or the patient would return the monitor to us. The results uh, then go on an in-house electronic system, which we can access and we can then review the results and let the patient know. So it's much quicker uh, the time between onset and air detection. And if there is a challenging case, then we use cardiology. This is really important because the Royal College of Physicians recommend that for a stroke of an unknown source, we should carry out monitoring for greater than 24 hours and oral anticoagulation should be given within two weeks of a stroke if AF is found to be the cause. And this is really important because treatment with oral anticoagulation can reduce the annual risk of recurrent stroke by two thirds for someone with atrial fibrillation. We had three aims. Uh, firstly, improve the identification of atrial fibrillation. Secondly, ensure those with atrial fibrillation receive oral anticoagulation. And thirdly, deliver a sustainable in-house service to detect AF in those with acute stroke. So we split our project into two phases. Phase one ran from July to September 2019, and we trained the relevant staff in the use and interpretation of the monitor, and we also collected our baseline data. Phase two ran from February 2020 to June 2021, and we identified patients who would be suitable for the study. We also gained nine Novacore R test devices to carry out the project, and we reported the results and audited the new pathway. We found in phase one, there were 244 patients with an ischemic stroke and no history of AF, and 95% of these completed the cardiac monitoring. New AF was detected in 10 patients, which was a 4% new AF detection rate. In comparison, in phase two, we included 172 participants and 97% completed the seven day monitoring. New AF was detected in 17 patients, giving a 10% new AF detection rate. 
Uh, the difference uh, compared to phase one gave a p-value of 0 0.02, so we found this to be significant. This graph uh, shows the median time in days from the onset of stroke, or TIA, to the review of the formal monitoring report and commencement of oral anticoagulation. Phase one is split into inpatient, outpatient, inpatient dark blue, outpatient light blue, and phase two as red. So, for example, for a patient who went through the phase one inpatient pathway, it took a median of five days from the onset to request the monitoring, 6.5 to start the monitoring, 10 to detect AF, 13 to complete the monitoring, 20 to review the monitoring report, 30 days to communicate the results to the patient, and 42 days to commence oral anticoagulation. In phase one outpatient, a similar trend except even greater delays. So, for example, it took 81 days from the onset of stroke to review the results, 96 days from the onset of stroke to communicate the results to the patient, and 126 days to commence oral anticoagulation if needed. So both these for phase one well out with that recommended two week period. In comparison for phase two, it took a median of one day from the onset of stroke to request the monitoring, two to start the monitoring, four to detect AF, eight to complete the monitoring, 11 to review the monitoring report, 12 to communicate the results to the patient, and finally 14 days to commence oral anticoagulation. So just on that recommended two week period. We did find, however, when we conducted phase two over the COVID pandemic, and we were waiting a day or two for a negative COVID result that probably just impacted our results slightly. So we're probably working to just under the two week period to commence oral anticoagulation in those who need it. So this graph uh, just summarises that information again, except this is just for the people who had AF detected. And it shows the median time taken from the onset of stroke to detect AF, review the results and initiate oral anticoagulation. So again, for phase one, a median of 36 days from the onset of stroke to diagnose AF, 37 days to review the results, and 41 days to commence oral anticoagulation. So just as I highlighted before, I with that two-week period. And then for phase two, it's the same again. We're exactly on that two-week period for commencing oral anticoagulation. Interestingly, we also found that of the number of AF cases detected in phase two, which was 17, the majority, 10, were detected between day zero and day two, with only three more being detected by day seven. So this shows that identifying people early, getting the monitors on them early within 40 hours, is a good early intensive method for picking up atrial fibrillation post-stroke. We didn't just detect atrial fibrillation, uh, we also had one case of VT and four cases of heart block as well as some short runs of atrial tachyarrhythmias of less than 30 seconds. But for the case of VT and heart block, we made prompt referrals to cardiology on the same day as reporting. There are some challenges, however, associated with this new pathway. And this includes the manpower required for reporting and analysis. So once you get the report that's produced uh, by the monitor, it means that a physician must go through uh, all the sections that are highlighted with AF and confirm that it is atrial fibrillation. And this is quite a workload on top of uh, clinicians' work already. There's also the training and awareness required among staff. So we would need to educate all our staff uh, being aware of prolonged cardiac monitoring and also how to use and interpret the monitors. There's also the loss and damage of cardiac monitors. And um, over the, the time that we conducted our study, we had one loss lead and one loss monitor. And considering that we only have nine and a few that cardiology lent us, we can't, we can't lose too many. And um, there's also the adoption in district and local hospitals. Uh, the QE has a really busy stroke service. It also has its own stroke research unit. So it's very well set up to support these projects. Um, however, in a smaller hospital that lacks these facilities, it may be much harder to implement the new pathway. Finally, to conclude, uh, the new pathway firstly improved AF detection, secondly reduced delays associated with the conventional cardiac monitoring pathway, and finally allowed for a quick identification of atrial fibrillation and initiation of oral anticoagulation. We showed that the in-house cardiac monitoring service is feasible and is a solution to delays in monitoring via cardiology services. 
I'd now just like to thank Dr. Abdul Rahim, who was my supervisor uh, for the project, Elizabeth, one of the stroke research nurses who helped me collect my data, and also thanks to Dr. Cameron and Professor Dawson for their help and input as well. And thank you for listening, everyone. I am happy to take any questions you have and hear my references. That's the end. Thank you. because we don't have long. Fiona, a quick one. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. hope so. Um, so that was using our test as a device to record AS, yeah? Yes. What about, I mean, extending this now to more modern technology? We've had our tests for quite a long time, and they're all right, but they're kind of bulky. What about Apple Watches? Is there a place to redo this? You know, you've got the model for the study done very well. Should you redo it now with the most modern wearable technology so it could be done on a wider basis? Yeah, I don't see any reason not to. Um, I don't know absolutely loads about the technology for detecting AF, but I don't see any problem with if the patient has their own Apple Watch and that wants to be used. Obviously, there is on top of that, I think, issues with Apple Watches and then the data needing to be read. But no, I think it's a good idea. OK, good. Thank you. Any other questions? Because I think this, this does change practice. This is a terrific study. Have you published it yet? Are you about to write it up or what? I have um, submitted it for publication. Haven't heard All back right, yet. Well, we'll look, we shall look out for that. All right, so we're going to head on. Thank you very much, Fiona Johnson. Terrific. Thank you.